It's often exciting to look to the future of UNO, what it might be like in times to come. Sometimes, though, it's important to stop. Stop and take a good look at the past of the university, the people and the happenings that help make the excitement of future history possible. With this in mind, join me for Reflections in Time. rather warm summer day, July of 1987. We're on the deck of a lovely home up in Raven Oaks, suburban Omaha. And the reason we've come up here, a crew from UNO and myself, is to do one in the many numbered series now we have of what we refer to as Reflections in Time. Reflections in Time, which, and if you're watching this, you're probably one of these two places, is for our library archives at UNO and for our alumni. A few years ago, I thought it would be nice to really save in a very live kind of way the many people who'd contributed a lot to our university. And to do this, we started making use of the state of the art, namely videotape. And what we do is sit down and visit with <coughs> lots of people about uh, where they've been, what they've done in their life, and especially their relationship and their feelings about the university and what it's meant to them and some of the people that have stood out in their working lives at UNO. And today we have a man who just retired a few months ago as we record this in the summer of 87, my friend and my colleague from the Department of Communication and friend of literally thousands of people around the world and hundreds, certainly here in Omaha, Bob Riley. Robert, glad you Good could you. sit down and visit with us today and talk about old times and new times. I see you're from the Harry Belafonte School of Introductions. Really? They see you give those long <laughs> Well, I tend to just go on a little bit today. I hope you didn't mind. No. Now, speaking of beginnings, you and I have talked about work a lot and where we're going, what we're doing, but I don't know that we very often sat down and I said, Bob, and I am now, uh, where did it all start for you? Because I know by background you're not a Midwesterner. No, I was born in Lowell, Massachusetts and uh, grew up there, spent my first 20 years there, attended Lowell High School with a very distinguished uh, graduating class, by yeah, the way. I heard you had some interesting people. Jack like Kerouac and Ed McMahon and Ray Goulding of Bob and Ray and the fellow who drew Sad Sack, a lot of those people. You st still keep in touch with any of them? Still keep in touch with uh, Ed McMahon. Kerouac, of course, is deceased and uh -huh. uh, I haven't seen um, Ray Goulding for a long time, but then I came to Omaha in 1940 originally. Yeah, but we and jumped a lot there because between Omaha and there was war and lots of things, wasn't it? No. Or did you come here first? Oh, yeah. Had you first been in Omaha, college? Then where, war. where did you go to college? I went my first year to Boston College. I thought you did. And yeah. uh, then yeah. transferred here to Creighton University. My dad was a colonel in the engineers. Well, and he was here stationed as an engineer, yeah, I see. He was sent out here. So I transferred and I went to Creighton about a year and a half and then in 1942 enlisted in the service. Did you come out of a big Irish family? Or a, a small modest, Irish family? Small. What's, uh, what's small in Irish? Well, since we have ten children of our own, <laughs> I came from one half that size. I had two brothers, two sisters. I was uh, second eldest and um, nice, neat, manageable size. Mm -hmm. So you went to Creighton and the war came along. Huh? When the war came, I was in the infantry, 78th Infantry Division. In fact, last week on my birthday, when I turned 65. In fact, the day we were going to do some recording, you had somebody come to see you, didn't you? Exactly, my um, old platoon sergeant. And I hadn't seen him since I put him on a stretcher outside of Kesternick, Germany in 1944. He's and right. It's interesting to see him. He now lives in California. and. Uh, we had a great overnight visit. I bet you did. Anyway, I was in the service for about four years. And yeah, and in the service. I want you to pause there. Don't jump out of service. You had some unusual experiences. You mean you want me to tell them about winning the war single-handedly? That, that can come later, but oh. yeah, you can mention it. Huh? <laughs> but uh, you uh, had brushes with death and some interesting, interesting experiences. Yes. Um, 
I think the one you're probably thinking of is when I was a prisoner of war yeah. of the Germans. Yeah. And I was in a building that was bombed in which 77 people were killed and two got out alive. And I was luckily one of the two. The other person was a friend of mine, too, who later went on to become a Lutheran minister. Mm-hmm. And uh, also lived, no, I guess he moved to Arizona now, too. But uh, that was, I had one of those near-death experiences, yeah. which had become so popular, I guess. Yeah, now. in fact, you thought you were dead, didn't yeah, you? Yeah, I while? did. Other people have mentioned that, too. <laughs> that was right? going on from time to time. Yeah. But, uh, Tell us about I, that, because I think it's really unusual, sort of otherworldish. I was in the building, and when the bomb hit, and I sort of knew that was going to be it, and said this little short prayer that I said I'd always say if I were going to die, and uh, felt as if I floated away. And as you know, this experience is very common to people of near-death experience, a sense of uh, freedom, of great peace, of hovering over your own body, which you could see as I could down there, hearing your own voice. Some people have more extensive um, experiences like going through a tunnel or seeing relatives. Yeah, yeah. I had sort of a tunnel experience, but as if I just had stopped at the beginning. And then I woke up, and um, the planes that had bombed us, there were British planes, had moved out of the area, and uh, it was a beautiful night. And I was able to dig down and get my friend out, and that was it. The rest of them either died in the explosion or were burned to death in the building fire. But um, And I think for many times years afterwards, every once in a while a little thought would come to you. Maybe I was killed there and uh, this, the rest of this is all part of a dream. You know, mm-hmm. you'll dream a long series of things in just a few seconds. So, but don't you, didn't you too, Bob, regardless of that experience, but all experiences wore off and you wonder, why is it we're alive and some of our buddies aren't? Why were, sure. were we chosen? Sure. And um, I believe everything is a reason, so yeah. I guess there's a reason. You don't, um, you don't always know. I remember one time I was writing an article about, uh, does God have a plan for me? It was kind of an interesting idea that one of the editors came up with. And because when you were young, and if you came from a religious background, your teachers or your parents would tell you, God has a plan for you. Mm-hmm. And this guy who was an editor said, I'm 43 now, and I keep wondering, when am I going to find out? <laughs> and so I went around and talked to a lot of people and said, do you think God has a plan for your life? And uh, are you doing it? And so on. And most of them thought that God did, but they weren't sure if, they'd, if they were living it out. How about you? And, I think uh, the thought that came to me when I was doing that was it really doesn't make any difference, I guess, as long as he knows what it is. And the point is that we're all sort of egocentric. We think this movie's about us. Mm -hmm. But the movie might be about somebody else. It might be somebody's life that you touched along the way that maybe you didn't pay that much attention to, and that's what it was all about. You were supposed to be there. Or maybe it's one of your kids who's going to do something. Uh, Who knows? Yeah. So it's, uh, I guess you just go through and play it out and hope that what happens is right. How long were you a prisoner of war? About six months. And then the war had ended and you came out, or how did that occur? The uh, war hadn't ended, but the uh, cavalry came through, and like in the old westerns, and um, overran the area. Well, they, they really came and brought yeah. you out, huh? Yeah, we got out, and uh, I was... What part of the world was it? Italy, Germany? Germany? In Germany in uh, Braunschweig, where UNO now has a program, interesting enough. I remember not too long ago, I was at a luncheon, and the mayor of Braunschweig was there. And he said, "Uh, has anyone here been to Braunschweig? And somebody said, yeah, Riley was there. He says, yeah, you were there. And I said, so I tried out my little German and said, uh, ich was a Kriegskanfangene, I was a prisoner of war. And he said, Actually, I am from Austria. I come from whatever. I think he moved out of town right away, huh? But uh, (laughs) anyway, that was a. It it was an interesting experience, and one that you're glad you survived. And my, you talk about memorable, lifelong feeling experiences. Then what? The war ended. You came back. Then I came back. Hale and Hardy. And uh, my first thought was to get married, 
and um, no. it was a good thought. Yeah, and indeed it has been. Uh, where did you meet Jean? I met her in Omaha. We were um, at the finest place a person can meet, at a church choir. Wow. I mean, what a deal. And uh, actually, I just had met her there, but I didn't really know her, and I went on sort of a blind date with her. Just been and, checking uh, over the soprano Ella section, and there was Jean. Huh? There she was. And I was a tenor. I don't know what she sang, I suppose, soprano. But um, in fact, I wasn't, although I liked to sing, I couldn't read music. I always remember that choir because I s stood next to a fellow who could read music. That's all that's good if you voice. can't. That's right. And you listen with one ear, mm -hmm. and you're just a split second behind. <laughs> the director, I thought I had this beautiful, strong tenor voice. And this other guy finally moved, and uh, I said, I'm through, Mr. Timmons. And he said, what do you mean? I'm really counting on you now. He said, you're the only guy left. I said, I can't read a note of music. He said, how have you been doing this for two years? And I said, well, listen to this other fellow. Anyway, I met Gene there, and uh, we came back. I think it's very romantic for you romantic listeners out there. Um, I called. As far as my wife and my mother knew, uh, They'd had some informal word that I was still alive, but the last official word they had is I was missing in action. They really received so, that, missing in action, MIA, as we say. Yeah, yeah. Wow. So I always remember the way they them back here. Oh, the way they handled that with my mother, and I think of her. She was a widow. My father had died in 42, and they called her on the phone and said, there's a telegram for you downtown. In those days, I guess they weren't delivering it. So she's all alone. She takes the bus down. She had no car. Didn't drive anyway. And went in there and picked up the telegram and says, your son, Lieutenant Robert T. Riley, is missing in action. You know, oh, thank you, ma'am. Goodbye. And she, she said she can't even remember getting home. But in any event... Um, they sent nobody personally to talk to No. Her. They handle it much better these days. Indeed, they do. So um, as far as anyone knew officially, I was still missing. But yeah, So I yeah. called my mother... Happened to be Mother's Day, which wow. was interesting. Your and, timing is good, right? And that's right. <laughs> and I landed in Boston, which was close to my hometown. So everything was just scenario, yeah. right? And then I called uh, my fiance, and uh, as when I called her, she was at the old Epley Field, and they had only the little red building. Yeah, I remember right it. Yeah. And they'd had a power outage, so all the lights were out, and they were working by candlelight. And the phone call came in, as she described it. And, all the other uh, passenger agents who worked for United Airlines sort of drifted away so she could talk. And I said, hi, I'm back. And when are we going to get married? Was this said, in the form of a proposal? Or had you already gone well, through that? we'd already gone through that. Oh, good. Yes, in fact, her father was an old Scotsman of the old school. And when I proposed to him, uh, I mean, when I told him that I was intended to marry his daughter, he tried to top me off on her older sister. <laughs> now, that was the way you try to do it in those days. you got to get them by age. Get them in order. <laughs> and I said, well, you know, she's a lovely girl, too. But anyway, <laughs> I called during that uh, candlelight uh, session, and uh, we planned our wedding for three weeks hence. And uh, I was in the hospital for a short time after that. Finally got out, came out, was married, stayed in the service an extra year. What did you Partly because I didn't know what I wanted to do, mm -hmm. and uh, I liked the service too. And but I finally got out, went back to Boston to go to school. Spent one year getting my bachelor's degree, finishing up at Suffolk. Another year getting my master's degree there, and then spent two additional years working toward a PhD in English. And while I was there, going to school, I worked in an ad agency, which is how I get into this business. Yeah. Now let's pause there, because this story I've heard before, but I want you to put it on this tape. The ad business has its ups and downs. A lot of them are kind of boring to people who just buy stuff, but your relationship with a dog-related account, I think you ought to share that. This was a small agency and a small account, wasn't it? Right. This agency I worked for, in fact, when I see these TV shows about ad agencies, and I think they're really not that funny. I mean, if they would do for an ad agency what WKRP did for a radio station, right. they great. could do it. My boss was a old Marine veteran of World War One and Two, who wore a pair of glasses that he picked up in Saipan, belonged to Japanese, had a crack across them. And, and he, he wore thought, these regularly? He thought they were good enough. 
his desk was absolutely awash in sorts of things and uh, papers and proofs and the like and uh, he was just a real wild and crazy Irishman at night when I would go home he and a friend of his from the Boston Globe would come in um, push all the furniture up against the walls take a tennis ball and play handball or take all of the many newspapers we had fold them up like a newsboy and see how far across the street they could scale them on the building and they'd sit around drinking booze and everything and I, in the morning one of my jobs is come in and put everything back you had to clean it out and uh, we had in there a woman who was buying space who called herself Mary Jane Sweet she sold Christmas cards we had a playwright who did a little copywriting there and was a real left-wing Marxist type of guy we had an artist that I, whose name I never knew. We just call him the Swede. And his little story of life was that he believed God had given him the power to pick the daily double, which he did on a circular side row. During working hours, yeah. I suppose. <laughs> sure. And then we had a secretary who was uh, not really as cute as Lonnie Anderson in WKRP. Otherwise, it seems like the cast could almost fit, That's huh? right. And uh, assorted other people that were running around there that... Uh, there was one guy who would sit in the lobby and he had a little spray can and he was always going to get us this red cap spray account and he'd say Mr. Shea, that was my boss, his name, he said Sss. <laughs> I've been working on this and he said I think we're getting close <laughs> there was another guy in a camel hair coat who had written one book which was really a compilation of news clippings and so on but accounts we had we I had, suppose you, this kind of strange behavior patterns attracted some strange accounts didn't it? it did, we had uh, a nightclub called Plinstrup's Village. We had one of these uh, health food uh, places, two travel agencies, a, uh, an army surplus store. And I remember them because one time we got 200 pontoons to sell. We finally sold them as wraps. But at the time, Larry Shea and I thought it might be good to sell these to a foreign government in Seems South reasonable. America or Central America. And we actually got a nibble on this. And while that was taking place, I got this great PR idea. I said, Larry, why don't we float them down there to South America? I could see a long chain of 200 pontoons. You now fall down. into the pattern of the kind of people you associated exactly. with. Exactly. And Shea, who was, after all, in the Marines and should have known better, thought it was a good idea. But at least we tried it with six of them first to see what happened. They went aground at Cape Cod. And we were sued Didn't for littering. Too far. <laughs> so anyway, Did you lose the suit? Oh, we had to pay. Oh. Sure. It was only a couple <laughs> hundred bucks. But anyway, the other one that you're talking about was a dog mattress. And since most of our viewers out there in television land aren't familiar with how dog mattresses are made, and you, don't care. True, they're casings, the big casings, and you pump at high force this alpaca, whatever they're lined with, inside and then you seal them up and then somebody comes along with a stick and sort of beats them and smooths them out and the fellow who ran this was a guy big tall round-shouldered guy that we called uh, snuffy because he had this terrible post nasal drip and uh, caused in part by his work of course the stuff flying around in yeah. fact in his office everything had about a little it was like a an early soft snowfall there <laughs> The telephone, the papers, the desk, the chairs, everything had a little soft focus on it. Winter and, Wonderland. And so you'd could have scuffed through this. And anyway, one day I remember, this is when I decided maybe I ought to get out of the business. I was in there talking to him, and my job used to be to draw a different dog on the mattress. We had a photo of the mattress, and I'd draw a German Shepherd and paste it on there, or I'd draw a Collie and paste it on there. And I was taking this over to show them because we ran in things like Dog News and Dog World that were filled with these little poems about Rover dying and the like. And, uh, well, Ooh, Noisy soundtrack. neighbors going by here, don't, don't you? Know? <laughs> and, uh, oh, that's one of my kids. Oh, no. uh, anyway, uh, one day I got in there and we were talking about this ad and he had one employee and this fellow collapsed and had an epileptic <laughs> And like oh, no, that. that's dangerous. <laughs> and I thought it was. Yeah. And here's this guy on the floor, and he's kicking around in all this dirt. And the and dust I, is coming up. I my mean. eyes are huge, and I said, hey, shouldn't we, uh, you know, 
like put a spoon in it? He said, don't pay any attention to him. He'll be okay. He said, he does that all the time. And I said, but no, he said, come on, let's get on with this ad. So, you know, finally the guy did recover and get up. But I thought at the time, do I want to be in a business like this? So I, from there I moved. I came out to uh, Omaha, Nebraska. I know Larry Shea, my boss, said when I was leaving, he said, why are you leaving, Riley? He said, listen, hang around. He said, I'll make you a partner. I'll give you half of what we have. And I said, half of what? So I left and uh, went off to Omaha. No, don't leave yet. Oh. Because there's one other story that you and I have talked about before that you got to... When you didn't die, but you nearly killed 400 people. Oh, yeah. Well, you, This is before air conditioning days. That's right. We were on the seventh floor of State Street, and State Street is sort of the Wall Street of Boston. Very busy street. And we had no air conditioning. But we had a huge fan in the window. I mean, one of these industrial strength fans. It was big. Weighed about four tons. Yeah, very, very heavy. And it was plugged into the wall there. And I was walking by Miss whatever her name is desk, and uh, my elbow hit this fan just at the right way, and out the window it went. I grabbed I the mean cord. I the whole fan? The whole fan went down onto the street below. And Seven I floor. grabbed the cord like this, but of course it was so heavy, it just ripped right through my fingers and down seven floors and smashed, and God, I stood there. I was in panic because I thought even if it just hits a car, I was making $25 a week. I mean, think how long it would take to get that taken. You'd and still if, be in Boston. If it hit a person, my wow. whole life would have changed. So I, I think I stood there two minutes. I couldn't move. Finally, I get on the elevator and I went down to the That was a long floor. ride. <laughs> yeah. And I get out onto the street, State Street, and I try to act very coy and so forth. And I see this guy, who was a window washer on the first floor, standing there. And it was an oil slick that this had caused, which was about the size of Bantry Bay. And it was out on the State Street and all around, and little parts and things there. So I came up to this guy and said, say, what happened here? Really if I knew nothing about it. And he said, I was just trying <laughs> this thing, just... I, I, he couldn't talk. <laughs> he was in a state of shock. Really scared him. And I shook my head sympathetically and walked away, and nothing had happened. I never told him I had anything to do with this. So if you're listening out there, Sam, I'm the guy that did that. Between this and the, and the prisoner of war story, we shouldn't be sitting here talking at all. You should either be in prison or dead. That's right. And I've had some other narrow escapes, too. But uh, driving, and uh, yeah. you think about all of the things you do in your life really that it's just a question of one second one way or the other yes. and you're, you've had it but anyway I came uh, after leaving that great job opportunity that my boss offered me there <laughs> despite that I came out to Nebraska to serve as public relations director at Creighton University but by now had your sizable family started to grow or begin we had three children uh -huh. at that time and uh, one was born in Little Rock Arkansas one was and two were born in Lowell and I came in as alumni secretary, public relations director, That's assistant development you, director, you were, placement yeah. officer. I had all those jobs. Oh, for heaven's sake. And to make extra money, I started to write. And uh, I even, as we've talked about, was pretty active in the early days of television. <clears> and uh, a couple of kids' shows. And Here in Omaha? Yep. Which channel? Did one for Channel 6, where I was an Irish pirate, and uh, introduced Long John Silver. You and Uncle Tom Chase on about the same time? Yeah, same vintage. What'd you do, tell stories? No, I just really introduced the film, you know, say, Well, now, today, we have a great film for you. Long, you know, that kind of oh, stuff. Oh, yeah, yeah, And then I sold products. We had uh, Alamito ice cream and oh, milk and uh, mm -hmm. then uh, Wonder Bread. And then I went later to Channel 7, and we had a show um, called um, Casey Jones. That was another film series. I remember that one. Introduced that. And then a few others. There was a, a show one time that we did, a panel show, remember, that had uh, Nancy Bounds of Nancy Bounds yes. Studio, Ed Corbett, uh, who was uh, then professor at Creighton University, uh, myself, and... Um, just about to say a name on blank, uh, former city councilman Betty Abbott. Betty Abbott. <clears throat> the four of us answered questions from listeners and gave her advice, and we were picked as sort of to play roles in a sense. Uh, I was supposed to be funny, 
Mm -hmm. And Ed Corbett was supposed to have a more serious look, as was Betty, and then Nancy kind of was off the Sort of off of what's my line? Except, yeah. But you were taking calls from, just calls from people there alive, yeah. They would ask advice on uh, family situations and yeah. whatever. And uh, anyway, I stayed at Creighton 16 years. Went into my own business for about eight years. From there you went to the ad business? Yes. It was a firm that had been called Holland Dreams Aren't and Poff. And then Bill Arndt left, and so it was called Holland Dreams and Poff. And I joined him. And it became Holland Dreams, Poff, and Riley. And then Poff left, and it was called Holland Dreams and Riley. <laughs> and uh, finally, now Holland Dreams and Riley are all gone. But the firm is now called uh, Rollheiser, although he's gone. <laughs> Holland, he's gone. It's not like a and revolving Kaler, door. Kaler's still there. Well, that's typical of ad agencies. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, now, the ad agency, that's a... There's a lot of people now who have a place to lose a lot of money, but also to make a lot of it. Mm -hmm. You did all right at that job, didn't you, Bob? As I remember, you were a very successful ad man. Well, I, I was successful in the sense, I guess, of <clears throat> making money. I was a partner. And... I was also successful in terms of being able to do some of the things, but I don't know that I had the commitment to it that some other people had had. And so eventually when I had a chance to teach, I realized by then that, number one, at age 50, I could see that most people get out of the business before they retired, either that or they died. And uh, that alternative didn't seem too good. It's really a pressure business, isn't it? Very much so, because you have to meet deadlines constantly. You're also under pressure to the people, the clients who pay the money and everything them except the ideas that you come up with. Yeah. And a lot of writing on things. You make it yep. bigger, you don't make it, right? <clears throat> That's right. You have, um, well, you've got to keep coming up with fresh ideas. What you did last week, you could have won awards and sold a lot of products, but it's what have you done for me today and yeah. lately. So there's no room in there, I think, for people who, can, who can't who can produce almost by the numbers. Oh, uh, you almost got to it, and now we start moving up. We've talked for a few minutes, but I think the big part of what we want to talk about are, for a while at least, are your relationships with UNO. Mm -hmm. And I would, knowing you briefly in those early years, never have thought that Bob Riley would uh, come over to Creighton, uh, or not to Creighton, but to UNO, or the University of Omaha, as we used to call it, I remember sitting down in your office once when there was a meeting with some of us. I remember being there. You probably forgot that you've been to so many meetings, but it was about your candidacy for the United States Senate. Congress. Congress, yeah. Okay. Tell us about that, because you never got there. That might have been an interesting experience. When was it, and who did you run against, and all that stuff? I forget the details, but I was a little bit involved in some planning session, I recall. Well, I started in 1969. The campaign, the election was in 70. And I think the reason I did it, uh, a group of people suggested that I try, mm -hmm. and they had some figures of surveys they'd taken that showed I'd had a chance, I'd have a chance. And so I thought, why not? I was interested in, uh, well, you know, like a lot of young people, I had great ideas how I could change the world sure. and so on. So I campaigned real hard, and had no opposition in the primary up to just before the last time for filing, and um, John Lavacek, who was a local television uh, personality, and did a news show at night. You probably right. remember John's show. Yeah, he traveled channel. to Vietnam. And, yeah, yeah. Uh, John filed, and John had very, very high recognition, like 98%, and mine was down around 33%, which mm. wasn't bad for somebody who'd never run. And in the primary election, um, it was very close. In fact, it was a recon election, but... Ultimately, I lost to John um, by about 120 or 30 votes, mm -hmm. and John then lost to John Y. McAllister, the mm -hmm. Republican, in the finale. And John McAllister told me later, he said he was always hoping that I would win because he figured I'd be easier to beat than um, Lavacek, but he changed his mind afterwards because John made a couple of, uh, John Lavacek made a couple of mistakes late in the campaign, or I think he'd have won yeah. that. Did you find that an interesting experience, even though you lost? Did you find it like oh, sure. something that was fun to do? Sure. It's, um, it's interesting. In some ways, it's discouraging because 
if you're a thoughtful person and a moderate uh, you find it's very difficult because so many people are at the extremities, particularly in politics. And uh, I think that was a uh, that was kind of a shock to me. Bob, that was an unsuccessful campaign, but out of it, I imagine you learned a few things that you found interesting about people and about how they relate to public and private figures, right? One way I learned to respect public figures, even those I disagree with, because I know how onerous it is to try to keep everybody happy and, uh, you know, to take all these late night phone calls from people and things like that. Um, so that part, I think, is uh, was a good lesson. Maybe a bad lesson is it was a little discouraging to see how polarized everybody is on issues and still are mm -hmm. to a great degree. I mean, no matter who the person is, uh, if I spend enough time with them, I'm going to find something that I disagree with. and. But everyone wants to get the perfect candidate, which is sort of silly. And we see this still today, yeah. I think, in yeah. the Iran Contra hearings, another one where people react very strongly one way or the other, and you have to take sides. But And changing people's minds is an unbelievable task, isn't it? Sure is. And I thought that if I had been elected, I might have been a one term person because if I'd done what I wanted to do at that time, at least, that might not have been popular with constituents here. No, you didn't go to Congress, you stayed here, you stayed in the ad business, but then a chance came to come to university and take a cut in pay, huh? Right. What in the world did you do that for? A big cut, 60% pay cut, but um, I did it because I wanted to. By that time, were you making some money writing? Because you've been writing a lot of years by now, haven't you? I was making some money writing, and the money writing enabled me to say, well, even though I'm taking this big pay cut, the writing will pick up a little bit of it. Mm -hmm. And so I wasn't, uh, instead of going to a 60% pay cut, maybe I had it down to a 35% pay cut with the writing. What intrigued yeah. you about uh, the university? I always wanted to teach. In fact, when I was in graduate school, that was my goal. My career goal was always to teach. Mm -hmm. I got into uh, advertising and PR kind of uh, along the way, almost accidentally. But the classroom intrigued me. I think anybody who's got any performing instincts in them uh, likes that. Yeah, and uh, I, agree. I also enjoyed sharing uh, things that you know. I mean, you, you learn a lot of things along the way. And I know you've had a lot of experience in yeah. PR and ad business and so on. And what's the good of that if you can't uh, tell them to somebody? Share it. And so it's been the years at UNO, 15 of them were very positive, very rewarding years. What were the things over the years that you enjoyed teaching the most, the things that you liked to teach about, tell about the most? Subject-wise, I suppose my two favorite uh, subject areas would be the ones that involved writing and public relations, although I also taught courses, taught courses in advertising. And, of course, another one I enjoyed is Irish Lit, which I oh, taught yeah. the English department every other year. And those were good. Probably the writing course was best because it was smaller. It would typically be 21, 22 students. And you got to know them a little bit better than you do in a class of 38 or 45. So that was enjoyable. And to see them develop and grow. And I know when I retired, I got an awful lot of cards and letters from alumni. I know, I saw some of them. And they were great. In fact, if it weren't immodest, you'd like to share them with younger faculty because sometimes you think students don't notice things, but their retention's amazing. But they'll write to you about incidents that you've forgotten that they found meaningful to them. Amen. No, that's part of the joy of, of teaching. It's yeah. uh, something that can come back to you and, like interest in years to come. It can be great. Uh, you came when Hugh Cotton was our chairperson, right? Yes. He you recruited me. Yeah. Ever regret it? Never. No, it was... Uh, of course, I've never regretted any decision I made, really. If you figure you did it with the best of intentions, with the information you had at hand, and why look back. But that particular decision was a plus one all the way. There are some things about academe that uh, I'm, you know, I would change if I were in the position. Like cutting down on the meetings? That would be one, definitely. 
and I think some of the uh, systems of rewards, although they've been very good to me, but some of the system of rewards uh, needs updating. I mean, they're, they're rather tenuous. We agree on them sort of the way you agree on a theorem in mathematics, that mm. these are right, but I'm not sure they are. We don't test mm. them enough. But the uh, by-play with students, even the preparation for classes, I thought was enjoyable. And um, UNO was particularly good place to be because, as you know, most of the students work. Yep. They're serious about things. They challenge you. They don't want to come in and listen to you rap about just anything. They want you on the subject because they're paying for it themselves. It's a very democratic place. All of my children have gone to uh, UNO, even those that went to undergraduate school in Ireland, came back and did their masters there. All ten have gone to school there. I didn't yeah. realize Well, uh, except the eldest who's deaf. She didn't go to college. Uh -huh. But uh, the others have all gone to uh, UNO. And I like that because I think the conditions and the people they meet there are much more like the ones they're going to meet in real life. Mm. I mean, if they'd gone to, uh, sometimes people go to school, they get scholarships and they go to school with a very wealthy set of students and they begin to think they're wealthy too. And they mm. get out and it's a rude shock when they find out that they're not in that set. You know, they can't, can't do the things. We've got kind of a melting pot, haven't we? Yeah. Of old and young students, variety of backgrounds. That's another thing. The, the older students are terrific. Oh, they, have their, they add a great deal to the school. And uh, I think the greatest reward for a teacher at UNO is to see, I think of older women. When I'm talking about older women here now, I mean they might be in their 30s. The older in terms of student right. population. And to see some of those come in occasionally, they're divorced, they'll have a child or two, they have had to go back to work, their whole life has changed. They feel insecure, maybe even a little guilty about things. Mm -hmm. And they start off there, and you see them four years later, and they're new people, and they have great confidence, and yeah. uh, that is terrific. I was going to ask you about students, and you told me a little about your feeling about them. Well, one thing I'd like to ask you about that before we get over and talk a bit in these last minutes on our hour or so about writing and things relating is a student again. You've had a house full of students with a family of ten children. They've grown and gone and whatever, and you've lived with thousands of them on the Creighton campus and then as a teacher over at the University of Nebraska at Omaha. Has the student, as you've known him and her, become different? Are they much always much the same? Are they predictable? What? What's your feeling about a sort of composite picture of a student in, let's say, oh, 1970 and 1980? Were they uh, a bit different? Sure, they're different, and but the difference is a difference that reflects the difference in society, I think, rather than any difference in the educational system, and it's what they bring to the campus that's different rather than what we're doing there that has altered that much. I just finished doing an article on um, for a Catholic magazine on our Catholic colleges. Catholic. And when you look at the students there today, some of the old alumni will say, hey, they didn't do... When I was back there in school, we used to have compulsory mass every week, and we had a compulsory retreat, and we had to take uh, 12 hours of theology and 16 or 18 hours of philosophy and so on. And today's kids don't do that. No. But today's kids, they're totally different. Yeah. And um, whether that kind of a regimen was any good or not is moot right now and because it wouldn't work. And I think the schools, the Catholic schools, and this is true of other religious denominations too, have realized this and they've altered the uh, curriculum accordingly. The, so, the yeah. Students, students very well reflected the culture of which they come from. Sure. Right? Yeah. Sure. We can... Um, That's part of the fun of it, isn't it, as a teacher? Right, that you learn along with the yeah. students learning. Yeah. I think uh, for those of you know, who know you mildly or have known you for many years as I have, they'd class you almost immediately as a creative person. And your work, your background, what you've done, tried to do, has been evidence of that. One thing we haven't talked much about, Bob, are the many years that regardless of either of these other things, the ad business, uh, teaching, PR, 
you sat down and other people have been out playing golf and doing other things and banged away at that typewriter, as you will probably when we finish recording this tape in 1987. How did you get into that really? And tell us a little more about that. Some of the things you've done such a great variety of writing, too. It's been an ongoing second or third profession as you've done other things. Well, if I had, if I were writing my biography and somebody asked me that question, how did you first get interested in writing? I don't know that I really know that. I suppose if I had to write something, I would attribute some of that to my mother, who was a great reader and always had books in the house. And I think every Did you start out being a good reader? Yes. Mm -hmm. And all of my kids are good readers. Uh -huh. I mean, some of them aren't that great in math or science, but those little suckers could read. Uh -huh. And uh, they could hardly wait until uh, they got old enough to read for themselves. And then I had an aunt, a great aunt, uh, who was an interesting person, had never gone to school, went to work in the mills at age seven, but she wow. self-taught herself how to read. She uh, read to me a lot, and she also tried to write. And uh, I think maybe from those two influences, then um, reading was honored in the house, I guess that's it. My mother and father cared about me getting decent grades. I began writing in high school. I wrote for the literary magazine there. When I went into the cert, when I went to Boston College, I wrote for the poetry magazine. Oh, did you? When I went into the service, I wrote for the camp newspapers. And when I got out, I began doing a regular column for my uncle's magazine, which was for salespeople and wrote my first book in 1954 and I've written 12 since and working on a couple more right now so you've been at it for well over 30 yeah. years yeah you know to me and to a lot of people who spent their life communicating but another way to writing it's just plain hard work mm -hmm. tough much tougher than just what we're doing now sitting here chatting but it's all communication uh, let me ask you this, and then we'll get back to some of the things you've done. Uh, when you're going to do a piece of work that just starts from an idea, uh, what's your pattern of activity? How, how do you go from there? You just sit down with the typewriter and start to type? Do you do something else? Uh, how does it go from an outline, from a sketch, from an idea from somebody else? What? I probably should outline more. I don't outline enough, but I do gather a lot of material. I'm working on several articles now. Fortunately, I've finally caught up with some deadlines. But I would say for an average article that I'll work on, I will read five or six books or articles and interview 20 to 25 people. Oh, you spend a lot So you have a lot reading. of information there. Then it's a question of uh, putting it together. And how to save that information that you get? Do you use a tape recorder? you take notes? What do you do? I take notes. Well, you've got a great memory, too, probably. No, I take notes, and I think uh, taping is good as well, but the problem with tapes, unless you use them right away, they get cold, and you've got to get back and listen to another mm -hmm. hour of conversation. So this way, I put down what I think is important. And um, anyway, once I get that together, I have sort of an outline in my mind, yeah. and I work on it. And the problem is, Sometimes it goes very well. Like yesterday, I, I had a deadline ahead of me to send it off yesterday afternoon, and I really didn't have a chance to do six or eight drafts. So I just sat there and I wrote it. And fortunately, it came together pretty well. I had the outline in my head, but it could have been bad. That's interesting. You're able. You're just like sight reading a piece of music. You sat down and just did it. Yeah. You couldn't have done that 20 years ago, could you? Maybe you could, no, but that seems I don't like think a thing I could. that a pro needs to do. For one thing, I type a lot faster than I did then. Now, this was uh, approximately 5,000 words. So, to, e to even type 5,000 words in a day is a fair amount of typing. It took me about two weeks, perhaps. No, that's, uh, that's interesting. But you haven't alluded to what I said uh, earlier, just a moment ago, was really it's hard work. It doesn't sound like it's that hard for you, but yet it's work like anything else, like mowing the grass or putting this tablecloth down. What do you find, I suppose we could say, the greatest reward of writing? I know you get paid for a lot of the things you've done, and you've done really well over the years, but there's more than that to it, isn't there? It is hard work, and but if you're a writer, if you think of yourself as a writer, I think you just do it. 
So a lot of people who want to be writers, but they don't want to go through the pain that you described to do it. Mm -hmm. It's difficult for everybody, and I, I find it uh, difficult for me. I, you know, I hate to sometimes get down and write, and I hate a lot of the mechanical stuff that goes into writing, but I just sort of force myself. I know I have to do it, and so I force myself to do it. The rewards, I suppose, are part ego and seeing your name there, part money, part fulfillment of something you feel you have to do, part uh, a chance to learn new things all the time because you're always researching, sure. some travel involved, and uh, as I think I've mentioned to you before, another reward is you have some options. You can do things, uh, I mean, right now, for example, as a retiree, if I didn't have my writing, I'd probably have to come up with some kind of a part-time job in order to flesh out the difference we need to live. Sure. But with the writing, uh, it looks like there'll be no problem. And so that gives me the option now of staying home and working from my house. You do have some freedom, but yet it requires tremendous self-discipline not to do other things that might seem more pleasant or easy, right? But you've been fighting that over the years, haven't you? Yeah, but you're, like, you're sort of like uh, a mother with a family. You know? yeah. There might be some other things the mother would rather do, but the kid needs attention, and you do that first. And I think that's the way it is with a writer. You uh, sure you can think of things you might enjoy or whatever, but you uh, you do the writing because it's there and it has to be done. However, I don't. Uh, while I probably don't play golf anymore, I don't feel as if I've totally denied myself. In fact, I, I feel like I waste a lot of time. Other people would say, you don't waste any of it. To me, it seems like it. I'll uh -huh. say, well, I really, uh, I look at a day and say, I think I only wrote for two hours that day. I say, what did you do? Well, you know, this morning when I get up, I had to get my car down, take care of it, then I come back, and I watered the lawn. So, uh -huh. and you take care of the dog, so you're probably gone there's an hour and a half or two hours. And we, we do could a have taping. Been we do a taping. <laughs> this afternoon I have to go out uh, to Wahoo. and. Um, but you are so. going to do some writing today, right? Yes, yeah, I've already done some. No, when I came back from oh, yeah. the watering, I had this was pretty easy kind of stuff, though, where it was for a new book for the university, and I'm just doing copy for it. You know, the, a lot of people write, and a lot of people have written for the number of years you have, but I wonder how many people have written a great variety of things. Make a list. What kinds of things have you done? You know, novels? Anything uh, to make a buck. I've yeah. written novels. I've written juvenile novels. I've written nonfiction. I've done three textbooks. I've done a lot of scripts. Um, a lot of articles. Some short stories. Poetry. Um, part of that is just, um, I guess, where the inspiration comes, and you have to follow it. If I were, I, li I love music. I and I would love to be a composer. I've written lyrics for song, but if I knew music better, I think I'd take a shot at composing. Have you too. learned to read music yet? No. <laughs> and yet a few minutes ago before we started recording, you sat down at the organ that your family gave you and started to play a little bit. So you still enjoy and are involved oh, yeah. in music still. You didn't give up on the choir. No, I can pick <laughs> out things one finger. My e yeah. ear will still play the tune. and. You got one of those organs that uh, fills in uh, rhythm, background, sure. and all that, and you can sound like you really know what you're doing. What uh, of all the things you've written that you've published, and maybe have that you haven't published, if you were going to put something at the top of the heap that you were proudest of, or two or three things, what uh, would come to mind as we talk about it? Any writer would probably tell you that the thing he or she is proudest of is whatever they're working on at the moment. Right now. Huh? I think this is true because the Irish have an expression, you always love the newest baby. <laughs> and once you've written something and it's published, it's dead. Uh, Hemingway said that. You kill it because you can't do anything about it. It's gone. That's it. And so you might have felt, well, that was fine and so forth. I hope that in a sense I'm proud of anything I've written because it was the best I could do at the time. Mm -hmm. And writers should always remember that. I, I tell students that, that uh, don't, if somebody says to you, I saw your article on the Gateway, and you say, oh, the Gateway, you know, what the heck, little school paper, yeah. say, hey, wait a minute, most of the students at UNO could not write for the Gateway. 
you're already unique and whatever you write you should be proud of and say that's the best I could do at the time so the I suppose of the things I've written if somebody said do a reading I'd probably end up picking out some poems and sections from articles and a couple of pieces from books but I don't think my best work has been done yet I hope anyway isn't that great because as healthy as you are you're going to keep at this for a long time to come aren't you I don't know about that. I, I feel good. But with your experiences in the past, it could be any time good. Enough. You never know. Yeah. I mean, I was rather shocked to find out that I had arthritis in one finger here. And, you know, everybody says, well, we got to expect that, Bob. And I yeah. said, what the heck? This is really, because I type one finger, and I can't really close that finger. It really hurts to type now. So you keep thinking, what if it was in that finger? I'd have to learn to type some other way of my Either that or get into the computer business and... That's right, Talking get that to soft it. touch, and uh, I hope I don't have to leave my little old 1945 Standard Royal. You have a definite pattern. You use the, the old typewriter, sure. that's it. Sure. That's a person almost to you by now, isn't it? It's an instrument, <laughs> like a pencil or a pen or anything. Yeah. Now, uh, the Lord has been good to you. You've had a long and a reasonably healthy life, haven't you, Bob? I have never missed a day of work for illness, which is, is remarkable. Right? Yeah. I've, uh, I've been in better shape mm. than I am now, and in fact, many people have been in better shape than I am. <laughs> but I felt uh, good, and I was always able, even some days I didn't feel exactly great, I could still get to work. And so that's a blessing, and I hope that I'll, uh, you know, I always sort of lived under the feeling since my father died when he was only 42. You worry about that. It has an effect mm -hmm. on you and say, well, I know when I got to be 43, I felt as if I'd passed a milestone. Yeah, I know. I would think of that in relation to my mother. I'm older than she was now. And that's something that is sort of a milestone thing, as you suggest. Now, speaking of milestones, you've had tons of them. One thing you haven't mentioned in your life as a teacher and as a broadcaster and as an ad man, writer, is the word inspiration from the those you touch and I think that's been part of your life the inspiration you've provided for a lot of people and I think as you would agree that that's part of teaching mm -hmm. uh, but now and we've got about four or five minutes left here Bob and I think one of the nice things about talking with people who've lived a long and fruitful and creative life as you have I don't imagine you have any set guidelines for suggestion to people but picture me for a moment here as a young boy or girl who's just about to start to make a career for him or herself. You've had lots of careers and successful things that have gone on. What are some of the things that you told your children and that you would just tell people generally to bear in mind when they want to try to make it in the world? One of the things you find out when you have children is that, and it takes a while for a parent, I guess, to release this, is that they're going to do their own thing anyway and you've got to give them a little latitude to do it. Mm -hmm. With our children, uh, for example, I think their um, religious practices are different than ours were. I'm sort of a more traditional Catholic, my wife is, and some of the kids are. Uh, you'd wish that maybe all of them were not so much so you'd feel like you'd done a great job, but uh, religion is a great comfort, I think, and uh, it's uh, it gives some meaning to life. I mean, if you you have to bottom line something, yeah. what is it that when you come to a decision would make you come down on one side or the other? It's either uh, you know power or uh, greed or ambition or or it could be some kind of a faith, and I think that's important. For our kids, though, two goals we had in mind, and I feel good about these, is one that they'd be very tolerant of other people of all races and creeds and different from themselves and they all are I mean it's really uh, comforting to see that the attitude they have toward others and the second thing we wanted from them is that they would all love each other and they get together reunions almost once a year mm -hmm. and it's nice to see your, your sons and daughters enjoy being with their siblings rather than their friends they enjoy being with the family. They love huh? being, and they uh, sit around and talk for hours and hours about things they remember, things you've forgotten, but mm -hmm. the kids will remember these things. And so they're a great joy, and the kids, uh, as far as I'm concerned, they've all done 
Well, everybody has a little different um, ability and different health patterns and different circumstances in life. Sometimes they'll make a bad marriage and you can't do anything about that and they pay for it and uh, have to start over. But um, all in all, I think it's been very rewarding and we're proud of all of them. Nicely said. Since this is going to reside in the archives and over at the alumni house now when we put this tape to bed, as we can say in the business, uh, a last look at the university. Fifteen years you've spent there. What, is, what does that all mean to you as you think back on it? I mean, sorting it through people, events, uh, what stands out the most and what's most memorable for you, Bob? One of the, uh, this sounds like a negative one because uh, it's a frustration. But one of my frustrations is that the people of this community have never really, at this point, appreciated what a terrific thing the university is. I mean, for some of these older students I mentioned, where would they go to get this fresh start? Yes. For people who could uh, not afford the experience, where would they go if they couldn't go there? Not to mention the fact that the university has grown so much and is excellent. I mean, the, I'm impressed with the quality of the faculty, the quality of facilities. Changed a lot in 15 years, hasn't it? It has, and it's a terrific place, and you just wish that everybody, I don't know how they, I don't want them to salute as they go by, <laughs> but you'd like them to have the impression that this is sort of grown up like one of your kids you didn't notice until she comes in and says, Dad, um, I need $5, I'm going on the date, and you say, what? How did you get to be a dateable <laughs> age, right? I think the school has done that, too. It's grown up before mean. our eyes, and it's an excellent institution. Robert, as is usually the case, when you and I get together, it's a fun time for me to learn and to listen. Stories, personal experiences, you've had a vast background, and I'm glad you shared part of it with us today. Thank you. You're welcome. Good being with you, Paul. We've been reflecting on the life and the times of my friend and colleague at UNO, Bob Riley. To put a dateline on this at the end of our little story that we shared and sharing the life and times of Bob, it's the summer of 1987. The place is a lovely place in North Omaha, Raven Oaks, where Bob and his wife and family still make their home. And this has been another in our series called Reflections in Time.